Hi, I'm going to start this uh, this uh, report of the nice meetings in Manchester in the middle, in a way, because it's a two-day meeting and um, uh, I've already been there yesterday and today is the second and final day of this particular meeting. Um, it's um, the, the committee has moved on to the consideration of their recommendations. Um, one one thing I am going to say right at the beginning is if you're in dentistry you have to learn the difference between preventive and preventative okay if you your you have to learn the difference between preventive the adjective and preventative the condom if you once you've learned how to spell fluoride then please make preventative the next thing that you learn because um, they can't stop doing it and uh, I know I'm a bit of a uh, pedant over grammar and stuff like that, but it really grates to hear uh, preventative used all the time. Um, the What I'd like to do is sort of give you a, a really, really good report on how things are going, but I can't because, quite frankly, I've, I've learned nothing and it's possible I'm not going to learn anything today either, and that's because... Uh, they are discussing their recommendations and the recommendations are not given to those of us who go along and sit in the public gallery. Uh, in the past where they have been discussing recommendations they've always done it in private and we've I was told yesterday what a great privilege it was for us to come along in the public gallery and watch them discussing them formulating the recommendations but the problem is that um, when you haven't got a clue what they're talking about you cannot form an opinion on what's going on so um, so so I'm I'm I am sort of dealing with the quango from hell here in that they are they want to let the public in but they don't want to let the public in if you see what I mean they like they want to say that they admit the public but then they don't want to give the public anything that they might need to form an opinion on what's going on um, I don't know why they think they're letting us in. I think they think that they're doing us a favour by providing us with free light and heat. That's the only thing I can think that the people in the public gallery got from it yesterday. Um, you know, you have you have to sit through hours and hours and hours and saying, well, should we go back to recommendation 39? Do you think recommendation 39 is the same as recommendation 40? We, we need to return to recommendation 4. How are we going to tie that in with section 1? And I'm like, well, okay, I know you, I know you need to do it like this, um, but, but really, we, uh, 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 if you're going to admit the public, you, you, presumably it has to be done for a reason, and the reason is so that they can see how these recommendations are arrived at. You're you're admitting them to the process, aren't you? You're admitting them to the the engine room of the uh, of the uh, Quango and of, of nice and so um, you know it's it's like uh, letting people in and then just putting a hood over their head I don't understand it and I don't think they understand it either and I think this lack of thinking through the various principles involved is um, worrying given that that is precisely what nice is supposed to be about it's supposed to be about deep thought and I honestly don't think there is any deep thought at all the other thing I was a bit disappointed is that um, I don't know if you remember, but a few netcasts ago I met with a guy from Nice at Euston Station. He sort of doorstep me at Euston Station, and I said before that I met him that I thought he might have one of two agendas. He's either there to try and put the frighteners on me because we were mentioning um, Linda Shepherd by name as as being the sort of the de facto chairman of the. Uh, meeting and that she didn't like that and, and I think that's still the case um, Alan Marion Davis who's the uh, nominally the chairman is there as a sort of a facilitator really um, uh, but Linda is very much conducting the meeting um, and or I said that um, you know he might be there genuinely to try and get some feedback so that they can change things and he did very politely um, listen to the feedback but I think that's with hindsight I think that's what it was it was just politeness because one of the things that we um, said was that um, it was very difficult to take notes as observers because we were sat there, and we still are sat in the middle of the room on on chairs <laughs> with 
with all our papers on our knees because they won't provide us with tables. And I think I mentioned that we, we would have liked to have had tables and then I think we had tables the one meeting after that and then that's it, tables go away again. So I don't think anything that I said to him is going to, um, is going to come to anything. And I don't think anything I said yesterday to Melinda, who's the, the sort of the public uh, coordinator or the coordinator of the chief warner of the public uh, against fidgeting, um, who sits there all day tapping away on her laptop for some reason. I don't know what she's doing on it. I think she's playing um, gems, that gem thing. <laughs> she's on it all the time. <laughs> Having said that they were banned, they're banned in the public gallery laptops for causing a disturbance and then she sits there next to the public tapping away on the gems thing all day. Um, but um, and I said to her yesterday, this is the only thing I found out yesterday was where the delegates were staying. That's the only bit of information they mentioned. And that's because they're organising another meeting, which is probably winding up now because we're, I'm getting ready to go in. So they'll, they'll have finished their, their pre-meeting meeting. So they've had a pre-meeting meeting, not open to the public, um, at, their, at their hotel. And um, that's all I found out. Um, so I can't brief you on anything. I, honestly, I'm thinking I might not come to the rest of them because if they're going to refer to a bunch of papers that only they've got and they're going to refer to them by number and not even say, yeah, well, this is the uh, recommendation about, I don't know, um, you know, whatever it is, then uh, I'm not going to be able to report and it's not fair really to spend my members' funds on, on uh, hotel, although this lovely hotel is rather reasonable. Um, and travel and not to be able to re report anything. I'm quite disappointed about that. That might change later tonight. I'll, I'll find out. The committee itself is also is at that stage, you know, with committees when they're trying to consider a document and someone says, um, uh, well, should we, we've got higher there. Should we use greater? Do you think we should use the word greater? Is greater better than higher? Does greater mean the same as higher? Does higher convey more meaning than it's higher what we mean or do we mean greater? And you're like, oh my God, you know. I know all committees go through this and uh, um, it's, uh, but it is, uh, th this is the point at which the chairman has to really, really crack down on people and say, look, you know, is it okay? The, the um, overall, things are not looking too good because um, they are, they are still, um, insisting that um, well they're still they're still showing signs of the fact that they really don't know what oral health is uh, they, they they still haven't got an agreed um, definition of what constitutes a high-risk group they don't know whether to make uh, recommendations for the population as a whole or high-risk groups only or both um, they don't know what um, the problems are in dentistry, what the main major uh, diseases that they're trying to cure or what cures them. Uh, and in fact, um, <clears throat> a very senior dentally qualified member of the committee yesterday said that uh, they're, they're working on the basis that um, there, are, there are no studies that show that visiting a dentist in, results in any improvement in oral health. Um, the argument is that um, people who visit the dentist tend to be um, very well motivated and more orally healthy naturally and therefore any um, any improvement or any difference between the cohort of patients who attend a dentist and those who don't is down to the efforts of the patients in in in, in entirety and not in no way down to the efforts of the dentist and this is an extension of their their sort of <clears throat> academic I suppose um, you know uh, Aubrey Shyam inspired attempt to try and discredit the dental profession as having any influence at all anything that anything good that happened in dentistry in the past 40 years is down to fluoride is absolutely the dental profession if it hadn't existed we would have had no, there would have been no difference in the population's dental health. And it's totally in, insupportable and on the face of it ludicrous assertion and uh, only uh, serves to illustrate the fact that they're not measuring dental health in any sort of meaningful way 
but um, they are sticking to it and uh, that was that was voiced yesterday and uh, someone else who is uh, a dental academic researcher uh, for whom I have an increasing amount of respect actually tried to um, counter that by saying that there were two studies which do show that uh, uh, dentists do have some positive impact on uh, patients dental health but um, I felt uh, like she was trying to swim upstream with this you know and that was despite the fact that we'd had a presentation from the Scottish Child Smile um, uh, where they have had improvements in child dental health and um, they have been uh, they are very tightly integrated into the surgeries you know I mean one of the questions they asked the uh, mothers of the newborn children is do you need a dentist uh, you know, shock horror. Do you need a dentist? I mean, we really, if this committee had its way, you'd never ask a question like that. You would be told that, uh, in fact, uh, the only thing you're likely to get if you go to a dentist is dental treatment, and therefore um, the best way to preserve your dental health would be to stay away from the dentist. Anyway, it's 12 minutes to go before the meeting starts, so I'm going to have to run, but uh, I may give you another update. Well, I'll certainly give you another update, perhaps on the way to the station, following um, what... Uh, what happened today? But if it's if it's all about uh, un papers, you know, references to papers that I don't have, then I may well just leave and and do something useful instead. All right. So I'll perhaps talk to you later. Okay. We're back, and uh, by which I mean we're back in Kent. And uh, that journey to Manchester is a bit of a killer journey. Manchester to Canterbury. We've got the high-speed train from Canterbury to St Pancras, but then by the time you add the train to Manchester on top, it's like a four-hour trip, you know, door-to-door, -door, just over four hours, so it is a killer. Um, and there's not much space on the trains, so I think this is the last meeting. The two-day meeting I've just been to, I think, is the last one. Um, they are just finally... As finalising the recommendations now so I'm talking of course about the nice guidelines uh, for local authorities on commissioning health and we pretty well finished I think where we started I think which is there's still a lot of confusion over what constitutes oral health what constitutes a disadvantaged group what constitutes prevention and uh, what's cost effective in terms of producing it we had another talk from the York guys. Um, I'm going to, rather than re rewrite my notes into some sort of script, I'm going to just sort of browse through them and talk you through them and then if I get stuck I'll just cut that bit out. So, um, we are, you'll remember I said earlier that uh, they, they had been referring to indigenous uh, Americans data on prevention and native Australian data um, they've dug up another thing which is Italian and Greek immigrants into Australia as a study because really they've got no data um, you know as I said in my column in dental practice I, I don't know what dental academics have been doing for the last 40 years because how can there be so little research on dentistry uh, I mean what have they been doing uh, it's supposed to be an expert committee and in fact there's almost nobody on this committee who's ever purchased any health or pro procured any oral health or, and yet they're being told that they're the expert committee and that if there are any gaps then they're going to have to make it up, you know, they're going to have to sort of polyfiller in the gaps. And that's done on the basis that they're experts, whereas in fact they're not. They're the antithesis of a panel of experts. They're a group of people who are experts on epidemiology and getting grants to carry out public health research, which as far as I can see is never put into practice. But um, what I would want is a bunch of people on the committee who'd actually done the job you know, who'd actually cured something. And it's uh, and that's precisely the sort of person they don't want on the committee because they think that sort of person would have a vested interest and would just uh, really recommend what 
they think needed to be done. In other words, if they had a lot of dentists on the subcommittee, then they would just recommend a lot, lot of dentistry. And uh, it's, well, you need to take your blood pressure pills when you go along to this, because you do hear statements like uh, the dental profession as a whole has had no impression at all on oral health in the last 40 or 50 years and it's all down to fluoride and I think and this was admitted at the meeting that this is uh, to a large extent because there is such a large amount of data about fluoride produced by the toothbrush companies um, but in a way they're sort of they're sort of creationists in a way a health creationists I, I don't know how they think things would happen the, the attitude they take is that if the dental profession was abolished then everything would be the same it's like that old creationist argument about how um, a jumbo jet must be made by God because the chances of a gust of wind blowing through a junkyard and, and assembling a 747 by accident is so unlikely that it must must be the work of God and uh, they're using very similar arguments on dental health basically they're saying that um, the dental profession is is neither here nor there and uh, a gust of wind w would have blown through the oral health of the nation and uh, it would have improved that gust of wind being fluoride so it's going to be interesting when they produce their recommendations to look at their references because we all complained when HTMO 105 came out that it was very badly referenced and uh, made a load of requests many of which had financial implications which were not based on any science uh, and I think it's going to be the same with this it's going to make a lot of recommendations and appear to be very opinionated and knowledgeable and yet it's going to be based on nothing it'll have nothing in the way of references they're still on course I think to make fluoride varnish the main recommendation I think they always were if you go back to the original rec videos um, I think I mentioned that at the beginning um, that, that's where we're going with this and possibly supervised toothbrushing because they're looking at the child smile program in Scotland and um, while they accept that there's um, there's not much data to suggest that supervised brushing does have an impact on oral health they cupboard is bare uh, we're talking mother hubbard here they're going to have to recommend something and I think uh, fluoride varnish and supervised brushing is really all they've got the public who uh, in the, or the people in the public gallery were gobsmacked we had a different bunch normally well it starts off with about two of us and now there's about six people go every time and mostly they're from local authorities you know commissioning authorities and what they want to know is which way the wind is blowing so that they can get their grant applications and uh, get the get to the head of the queue for the money uh, with the commissioning bodies in terms of keeping their particular programs going but as they said and, and this is the the people in the public gallery are actually doing the job first of all they said is one there's there's nobody in there who is actually doing the job um, and the second and the second thing was that someone made the remark that they'll they will never trust a recommendation from anyone again because they for the first time they'd seen that there's absolutely no substance behind any of this but um, broadly speaking they just go along and if they write it up afterwards they they get they can get some CBD for it which is uh, why they go and it's a bit of a day out you know British Dental Association is still nowhere to be seen I mean nice recommendations for commissioning oral health I mean don't you think that that's going to have some sort of long term impact on primary care do you, do you not think you should be there do you not think you should have been there it's too late now looking at how these things are formulated and if you're going to respond to these things surely then rather than just respond it would have been better to have gone along to the meetings and said look we're making these comments based on um, our knowledge of the way that these decisions are reached whereas 
you know, and we don't agree for this reason or that reason. There are a couple of people on the committee who are speaking sense, but they're in a they're in a minority. The actual, as far as the actual recommendations go, I think they they're going to be built on quicksand, pretty much uh, so much as to be effectively useless. Oral health education in nurseries is. Uh, we're, we're going to put the oral health of the nation in the hands of three-year-olds, apparently, and then as they get older, the the fluoride varnish. Uh, what else? The other thing they keep doing is using the word preventive, preventative instead of preventive. We don't have the papers. I think I mentioned that. Um, meeting with, uh, I think I mentioned that. Yep. So this, that was the child small presentation that they gave us. I think it costs about fifteen pounds per child to do this. That's in addition, I presume, to the cost of treating children on the GDS. Which makes me wonder what you could do if they were actually to give that £15 per child to the GDS, to the people working in primary dental care. They're still up in the air about what groups to recommend. Um, I mean, a sensible thing, and, and because I don't want to be too negative about this, a sensible thing would be to do what every dentist knows is sensible, which is to base things around um, the first tooth coming through, um, the hand off to university when there's always a big drop in attendance then again around about the age of 35 where people who haven't been since they were 18 start to think you know and perhaps I'll just start going back to the dentist and in turn come in with their own children and then around about 50 which is when most people start to think long term about their teeth and Perhaps their teeth are getting a bit dark and they've got a few old fillings and they start to think about cosmetic stuff. So that would be my four stages. I think the key to it, and uh, of course if you've worked in practice you'll know this, people are receptive when they're receptive and if they're not receptive there is absolutely no point. There is absolutely no point. And I cannot make this strongly enough. It's all very well saying you've got to get people in to brush their teeth and you've got to get people to give up smoking. How many of us have tried to suggest to a smoker that they give up smoking at a time when they're not receptive? It's water off a duck's back. It is a total waste of everybody's time and money trying to get a smoker to give up smoking if they're not in the mood to do it. What you need to do is concentrate on finding those people who are in the mood to do it and then throw the kitchen sink at them and, and help them at that time. And it's the same with brushing. What's the thing everybody hates about coming to see the hygienist? They're going to get told off. Why do they get told off? Because they're not receptive to advice on oral hygiene. And you can't, by being nice to them or telling them ten times, which is what we do, make them any more receptive. What you have to do is find someone who's had a dream that they're going to lose all their teeth or they've got a loose tooth and they finally you know, start taking thing, all, all the things you've been telling them seriously or they've got a big birthday with zero in it or it's just come to the top of their entry, their mental entry of things to do. Concentrate on finding those people and then really, really give them exactly what they want because then it will go in. They'll soak it up. You'll get real behaviour change by doing that. But this um, blunderbuss approach, this scattergun approach to oral health and prevention is pointless. And it's, um, it's, count it's counterproductive, it's not cost effective, and unfortunately that is the public health approach. It's the, the one in a million it's, it's the spammer approach, it's the junk mail approach. You send out a million leaflets and hopefully two people reply because your response rate is so low. So what you have to do is you just have to bother everybody all the time and then by accident you catch the two people 
who have it at the top of their mental entry. But you could have caught those, those two people anyway. And the way you catch them is you give the practitioners an incentive to achieve the goal that you set. So, for example, your goal might be to reduce periodontal disease or to reduce decay. You give the practitioner the goal of reducing the decay rate. You agree on what's a reasonable reduction and you just say to the practitioner, look, we'll share any savings made. It's called a shared savings model. And it's used a lot with railway franchises and things like that where a lot of public money is going down the drain and you suspect it could be done more efficiently. There's no incentive on the person who's subcontracted by the public sector to do it more efficiently. So what you do is you say, look, you know, if you save a million pounds, you can keep half of it. We'll have half back. That's money we wouldn't have had. You can have half a million. Um, and at the end of the day, you all have saved a million. So it's win-win, but um, we're not anywhere near the shared savings model in, in health or dentistry. In fact, there's a lot of resistance to it on the health service because we're not in the mood to give the practitioners the money for doing the prevention. We really aren't. Practitioners are paid to do stuff and uh, not to save money and not to cut disease rates and that's why prevention has never worked in this country anyway. It has worked in uh, third party systems such as uh, in capitation like Demplan, Practice Plan, and DPAS and all that. The reason why it works there is because it's a shared saving. You, you take a patient on, you agree a fee and if you can cut their decay rate or cut their rate of periodontal disease they come into the surgery less often, they need less advanced work, cheaper work and you keep any money you save which then gets ploughed back into the system for the benefit of new patients and in terms of reduced capitation fees for new entrants uh, because the scheme's costing you every year less and less but um, anyway blah 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 since dentists are ineffective said that if most uh, dentists examined a six-year-old wouldn't know what to do. This is someone who really should know better than to say that. That's all I'm going to say at the moment. This is someone I'm very cross with. Um, the other thing that I sort of picked up was the, the fluoridation thing. They're all obviously very keen on fluoridation, but um, it's not the remit of this committee to consider fluoridation. So, this is, this is just my impression, is that if they can't get fluoride in the water, they are going to paint everybody's teeth with fluoride. That's, that is plan B. Can't get it in the water, so we'll just slap it all over everybody's teeth on a one-to-one -one basis. Um, They've produced the statistical model which they're going to use to base their recommendations on. It's <laughs> words are failing me really. There are there are three variables in this model. One is the quality, quality adjusted life year, which is what NICE always uses. Um, where one quality, one life year is one one really really good year, like the best year you ever had, would be worth one. One year of being on your deathbed, where nobody knows if you're going to die in the next hour or two, would be worth about zero point zero 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 one. So that's how much quality there is in a life year, and they can't agree on that. Then. There's the second variable is the cost of the intervention. So, for example, the cost of painting fluoride on people's teeth. And they can't agree on that. Um, they can't For any intervention, they can't agree on what it will cost. And the third variable is the reduction in the risk. In other words, assuming you paid for the intervention, what effect would it have? How much reduction would there be in the risk of decay? And uh, on a scale of 0 to 1. And I think the best they 
gone was about 0.57 which was fluoride varnish so in other words in a hundred or if there would otherwise be a hundred fillings if everyone was painted with fluoride varnish then there would be 57 fillings but that's a complete guess and everything else is a complete guess they've got fluoridated milk all health education in schools supervised brushing each one has been given a score from zero to one and they were told in the meeting not only not to compare the scores but because they're not statistically robust enough to be compared but they're not statistically robust anyway so don't take any notice of them anyway <sighs> and there's the stuff where they don't know whether it would work or not they've like home visits to improve dental care access they don't know whether that would reduce decay or not so they've actually written down that it doesn't work and one of the other members of the committee thought that was a bit naughty because as she said um, lack of evidence of effectiveness is not the same as evidence of lack of effectiveness so what else I think that's about it really yes they were they were looking at uh, costs and they were not at all sure about the costs there was one thing that said the the average cost per child was £15.82 I think that was the child smile and then there was a varnish program for schools which was based on a three year program in Islington and the cost for that was given at £32.21 average total cost per child um, but then the question came up this is a three year program so was that the cost for three years in other words £10 a year or was it £32 a year for three years or in other words £96 and the person from York Health Economics Consortium who was giving the presentation said they didn't know so they, they only had two figures um, and one of which they didn't know if it was out by a factor of three and they were the only two programs that they had cost, costed We will make all these things clear when we write the report. You see, you know what? You can learn a lot in a toilet. I this wasn't my personal experience, but one of the members of the one of the other members in the public gallery came back into the meeting room during the coffee break and said that she'd been in a cubicle during the break and um, several of the committee members had come in and said admitted they, they don't know what the flip is going on and that they you know let's just say that the quality of the evidence was poor and they were being asked to reach a decision uh, based on nothing and didn't know how they were going to do it yeah see fluoridated milk they put down cost savings minus 29 pounds but if I remember correctly, right from the beginning, from the Bayesian scrape of the original research, they said that fluoride, fluoridated milk was only cost effective if um, you could get someone else to provide the milk. And I think that was on one of the earlier videos. So they, they put down the cost savings based on their totally invented figures in terms of the qualities gained and left out the cost of doing it so everything looks like it's saving money except that in almost every case the cost of actually paying you know intervening would more than make up for any saving in cost so all in all it's a complete um, fabrication they're assuming a quality is worth about twenty thousand pounds but then they started talking about quotties which is a concept I think Liz K brought up which is the quality adjusted tooth year um, we were I was waiting for them to say how many quatties were in a quali but th they brought quatties up and I think they were pretty well very quickly stamped down because it's such a ridiculous idea they said they looked at it but there were quite frankly too many permutations of teeth to come up with any sort of um, usefulness as far as uh, a tooth goes because every tooth has to be seen in context and in terms of even when children 
should go to the dentist recommending the first visit. There's so much confusion because they were arguing that should it be, um, they recommend a child that is brought to a dentist as soon as possible. In other words, say the child's two months old, the parents are coming in for a checkup, should they bring the, the two month old child in with them? If not, then should they say that the child should come in at six months? Because they've still got six months mentally in their head as a checkup interval same as everyone else has. So the plan is uh, to say, well, look, if they haven't come in before two months, then at least make sure that at least they come in by six months. And then it was pointed out that some children might have no teeth through at all at six months. And the dentist may well turn around and say, I don't know why you're bringing this child in. Bring them back in when they've got a tooth at least, you know. Um, and so then the discussion moved on to whether they should recommend that the child is brought in when the first tooth comes through, even if it doesn't happen for nine months. And, you know, it carried on like that. It was like um, with the, the fluoridated milk. OK, if we recommend fluoridated milk, or let, let's say we don't recommend fluoridated milk and say that we don't support fluoridated milk, Will some local authorities who've got fluoridated milk schemes withdraw them? Because they're not supported by NICE, so they might stop them. In which case we may be depriving children of milk. So is it better for a child to have um, fluoridated milk, even though NICE is pretty much against it, or no milk at all because of NICE? And the whole thing on uh, it went on like that. So I think it's, it's, it's the last time... I'm going to be sub subjected to it. Following this video is probably the last time I'll ever be invited. But uh, <laughs> I have to. Uh, I have, in fairness, to correct something um, that I said early on because I did ask Miranda if I could uh, borrow half a table to rest on, and she did say yes. And I said that I had a sneaking suspicion that she was playing Candy Crush. But um, I have to say that she wasn't. Uh, I managed to have a sneaky look at what she was doing uh, and in fact she was doing emails. So if you ever register as a public observer for one of these meetings it's not an automated system at all. She's sitting there, every email's written personally so which all makes work for the working man to do. So we might do another follow-up when the recommendations come out, but I've pretty much told you where they're going with this, so if you haven't got shares in fluoride varnish, then I would get some. And uh, we'll see where it goes, and I uh, hope this has been helpful, and please sort of like and recommend, do the necessary with the video, forward this link to your friends or, or whatever, and um, I'll talk to you next time.